Let's do another round of Q&A, Black Eye Edition. I'm a blue belt and feeling burned out. Blue belt blues is real. How do I get through this? The blue belt blues is a real thing. Now, what is the blue belt blues? Well, it's when you come to class day after day after day after day, and it feels like you're waging the same battles over and over and over again. It's when you have this long stretch where it feels like you're not getting any better. It feels like you're just walking through the mud, going through the motions without making any progress toward getting better at jujitsu. If we can agree that jujitsu is an amazing microcosm of life, what do I mean by that? It means that the lessons that we learn on the mat have huge applicability to our real life. Jiu-jitsu is not the real life. It's a proxy for life, and it's there to teach us lessons which we can use in our life. If you become tougher on the mat, for example, you'll be tougher in your real life. If you learn to be better at problem solving on the mat, you'll become better at problem solving in the real life, and so on. So, what is the lesson that we need to learn by going through the Blue Belt Learns, the Blue Belt Blues? The lesson we have to learn is resilience. It's the willingness to keep putting one foot in front of the other on this path, even though it feels like the path is going nowhere. It's, uh, it's the lesson of dedication. It's the lesson of commitment. It's the lesson of doing the hard work, even when you don't feel like doing the work. And that is gonna have huge carryover into the rest of your life. The easy thing to do is just to quit. But if you quit, what are the lessons down the road in your real life that you're not gonna be prepared for and that you're gonna end up quitting? So how do we get through the Blue Belt Blues? The way you get through it is you recalibrate how you think about what is happening. And instead of seeing it as this negative, you see it as this positive period in your life where you're learning huge life lessons and you will get through the Blue Belt Blues and when you emerge, your game will be better um, and you will have learned some lessons that have a lot of carryover into the rest of your life. I'm 51, started BJJ in January and my knuckles are in major pain, especially the ring finger on both hands and also my main knuckle of my index finger. How can I roll and at the same time recover? Yeah, let me give you a couple strategies. Number one, you got to tape your fingers. Uh, I tape my fingers. I don't tape them all the time, but when my fingers start hurting, uh, my knuckles are definitely bigger than they used to be. It's called cauliflower knuckles, and I do have some finger problems. So I, I tend to tape my fingers pretty regularly. I also have a neoprene sleeve that sometimes I'll even put over the taped finger to give me that extra layer. So if you don't know how to tape fingers, just go to YouTube and punch in how to tape fingers for BJJ and you'll get lots of instructionals on that. So tape your fingers, number one. Number two, don't grip as if your life depends on it. It doesn't have to be so intense. When you're new at jujitsu, you tend to grip really, really hard. But as you get better at jujitsu, you realize that the purpose of gripping is just to give you a connection point that allows you to track. If someone pulls, you go with it. If someone pushes, you go with it. You're just tracking. You're not necessarily trying to firmly control someone. You're just trying to track their movements through your gripping. In Japanese or in Japanese jujitsu in Japan, they have a saying, and that saying is that softness controls hardness. And what they mean by that is that if you want to control somebody who's very stiff and you know engaging their muscles uh, with a you know a lot of tension, the way to control that is by being soft and you're just tracking. So that's number two. Don't grip as hard. The third piece of advice is. Even when you're in the gi, try to grip the way that you would grip if you're playing no gi. 
Um, in the Nogi game, we use a lot of C clamps. You might clamp, clamp on, the, on the wrist. You might clamp behind the elbow. Uh, sometimes we use butterfly grips, uh, gable grips, S grips, uh, three-fingered grip if you want to scissor. I mean, there's a whole gripping methodology that we employ in Nogi Jiu-Jitsu, which honestly you can apply to your Gi Jiu-Jitsu game. Now, I do grip in the Gi but I try to, wherever possible, merge my no-gi game with my gi game so that I'm not gripping quite so much. So if you do those three things, tape your fingers, grip softly, and try to approach the gi game more like you would the no-gi game, which is much less hard on your fingers, then I think it's going to be a lot easier on your hands and you'll be able to recover. I am from Costa Rica. I'm 51 years old. I began to train last October and since first months I had problems with some exercises when I must be in an inverted position. My neck began to hurt me and tingling hands. One time during two days I had tinnitus and I was very worried. So the inverted position that Ronald is talking about is what we call the plow position in yoga. It's where you're on your back but your legs are over your head and your feet are sometimes even touching the mat, the inverted position that we think of in jujitsu. So my recommendation is stop inverting. Just don't invert at all as part of the way you play jujitsu. If your instructor has you guys going into plow when you're warming up, you need to tell your instructor, hey, I can't do that. I've got neck problems, I can't do that. When you are rolling, don't invert. If you're in guard, let's say, closed guard, and you go to set up, let's say, a triangle choke, and your opponent uh, comes forward and starts stacking you as a counter to that triangle choke, you need to immediately let go and go back to guard. Or if you set up an arm bar from closed guard, your back is on the mat and you go for the arm bar. If your opponent tries to stack you, immediately wrap your legs around them and go back to guard. You have to be very, very disciplined about avoiding any position in which you are putting pressure on your neck. Now, I do invert personally under some circumstances. There are some half grambies or gramby rolls that I will do to recover guard or do some other things. Um, but I'm very conscious that I need to be on my shoulder and not my neck. Uh, but for you with some neck problems, you know, some uh, nerve impingements is what it sounds like, um, then you need to just avoid being in an, in an inverted position. And it's very possible to play jujitsu that way. Most of the time I don't invert and, you know, I'm able to play the game of jujitsu perfectly effectively without having to invert. Rick, I could use some insight on injuries. I dislocated my right shoulder a couple years ago, followed by a surgery that seemed to increase my stability and the shoulder has felt nearly normal for about a year and a half now. Last week, I unfortunately dislocated it again from a quickly applied Americana and although my shoulder feels okay overall, it's starting to make me wonder how best to approach BJJ long term. The operative term in your paragraph was a quickly applied Americana. What that tells me is that you are letting your arms dangle out in a way that makes them vulnerable to being intercepted and that Americana being applied quickly. One of the things that happens as you get better and better and better at jujitsu is generally submissions don't happen all that quickly because you are positioned in a way that makes those submissions very, very difficult to get at least quickly, they, you know, uh, the person has to set those things up in a way that is more incremental rather than more sudden, right? And so for you, what I would suggest, and you've actually given me uh, um, um, a great idea for a video on this subject, and that is the subject of how to play a defensive oriented style of jujitsu where your elbows are always in. I preach this to my students all the time. Your elbows have to be in. And 
This is not elbows that are in because you can get a bite on the elbow. This is not elbows that are in because the tip is sticking out and you can get a bite on it. When I say elbows in, I mean you take your elbows and you actually dig them into your abdomen below your rib cage. You stick them in there and your hands can either be up, sometimes the hands are down, sometimes the hands are doing whatever, but your elbows are glued to your rib cage. When do you do that? You do that when you're in side control on the bottom. You do that when someone has your back. You do that when you are in someone's guard. You keep your elbows in. Um, you do that when you are in half guard on the bottom. You keep your elbows in. You do that pretty much from all over the place. You keep your elbows in. So my prescription for you is learn elbow discipline, elbow discipline. And again, I might do a video on this subject because it's pretty important, but always keep your elbows in. If your arms are dangling out, if someone mounts you, let's say it's very common. They're attacking your neck. Your arms are up. You're defending. You're all over the place with your arms terribly inefficient and you're leaving yourself vulnerable to having your arms exposed. A better strategy when someone mounts you, elbows in, get your frames, tuck your neck, and you're fine. Your arms are not in danger. Nothing good generally will come if your arms are away from your body. That's the general rule in jiu-jitsu. Arms away from your body, danger. Arms in, safety. That's what you need to do. Blue belt, moving to a new city this fall, but I love my old coach. Is it ever appropriate to continue advancing under the old coach if you train at a new school? Thanks for all the great content. You're welcome. Uh, generally, no. I mean, generally, wherever you are training is where you are advancing. After all, when you are training in an environment, what you're doing is you are taking instruction from that instructor and you are utilizing those training partners to help you get better. We can't get better at jujitsu by ourselves. We need good training partners. And so you are utilizing those re resources. And so it is not appropriate to then tell that coach. And in essence, you're telling those training partners that you don't really value them because your loyalty lies with an old coach. So generally, no, you, wherever you are, is where you're going to advance. Now, there are some exceptions. Let's say you're a brown belt, you've trained under the same coach your entire journey the last eight or nine years. Um, maybe you moved to a new environment for work reasons or whatever. Uh, you know, that's one of those things where you've probably earned the right to get that final belt from your old coach, something like that. I mean, there are some circumstances under which it would be appropriate. Maybe you live, you're a student, you go off to college, so you train one word, one you know place during your the school year, and when you're back home in the summers, you train somewhere else. Well, then you have to figure out who your main coach is, and that's kind of who you're under. But you know, those circumstances are exceptions. Generally, wherever you train is where you advance. What are your belt expectations for older grapplers? My belt expectations don't change based on age. In other words, if you have to be effective at a certain level to be a blue belt, if your movement has to have a certain quality to it to be a blue belt, if um, uh, your knowledge base has to be at a certain level to be a blue belt, then those are the same expectations regardless of age. Now, my expectations don't include physical attributes, right? If I say uh, to someone that they have to have a certain quality of movement to be a purple belt, speed, explosiveness, athleticism have nothing to do with quality of movement. It helps if you're more athletic, but quality of movement has to do with minimizing the steps from point A to point B. It has to do with uh, being structurally sound and being efficient and being able to get yourself from here to there with a minimum of, of effort. And someone who's older, right, they can have beautiful quality of movement, even though they might be moving slower and not be as athletic. So the requirements don't typically change. Um, what happens, though, is that the older athletes a lot of times have to train a little bit longer because they need a little bit more technique 
to overcome some of their physical deficiencies in order to meet that requirement. So if you're an older athlete, expect that it's going to take you longer um, because again, your, your technique has to be a little bit higher to overcome some deficiencies in order for you to meet that requirement of effectiveness and so on. I'm wondering whether I should compete or not started BJJ this last January at 52 years of age. I'm concerned about getting injured and not being able to train and I want to expand and grow. The challenge at age 52 is that in most tournaments, most regional tournaments, most local tournaments, they don't have guys your age generally competing. Uh, most of these tournaments, grappling industries, fight to win, Naga, etc., they only have two, two adult divisions. They've got the 18 to 30 division and they've got the over 30 division. Um, and since most people that train jujitsu are a lot younger than 52, it means that you at 52 are probably going to end up going against guys that are 20 years younger than you. And the reality is you're probably not going to have a lot of success in competition against those guys. That's the truth. And in competition, there is always more risk of injury. We went to Grappling Industries a few weeks ago. My team did. Um, I was there all day long. And at the medic table, there was a steady stream of people throughout the day with you know, getting their shoulders iced, blown ankles, etc. So if I were you, I would think carefully about competing at your age unless the tournament allows you to go against guys your age. No gi versus gi belt promotions. Are there any differences? If I go back to training BJJ, I plan on only doing no gi BJJ. If you train under me, uh, I will not award a belt if you train only no gi. You have to actually train both. I require both gi and no gi. Why? Because while there are many, many similarities between gi and no gi jujitsu, they are very distinct in a lot of ways in terms of gripping options, in terms of the distancing, the range, the control options, the finishing options, etc., etc. Um, they're you know, different systems in a lot of ways. And the ideal jujitsu practitioner, in my opinion, is someone that has mastered both of these things. And that's what's going to make you most prepared. So under me, I, you know, my, my requirements for rank, for earning rank, are that you train both. Now, if you go to a, a 10th planet system or uh, an environment where it's only no gi, then of course you will be able to earn rank there. Um, but you're probably not going to, that rank is not going to be recognized if you ever jump in to a gi training situation. I know a 10th planet black belt who went, decided he wanted to learn the gi game. And so he jumped into a Gracie Baja environment, even though he was a black belt under 10th planet, they made him start as a blue belt in the gi um, he earned his belt. He earned his black belt very quickly. He got to black belt in like five years in the gi. But again, these are distinct systems. So if your plan is to train only no gi, you need to be in a no gi only environment. Otherwise, it's highly unlikely that you're going to be able to be ranked if all you do is train no gi. Rick, do today's new students have an advantage or disadvantage due to all the content and resources available nowadays? Live rolling and technical at my academy are great and I'm learning a ton from the professors, but I enjoy soaking up more videos content online. As a white belt, I don't know if this is harming or helping my progress. It's been my experience that the greatest single determiner of how good you get in jujitsu is how much mat time you put in, how often you go to class, how much drilling you do, and how much mat time you put in. That's going to have the greatest benefit of all. A lot of people like watching YouTube. I was always one of those guys that loved to watch endless amounts of jujitsu on YouTube. And it's just an expression of your interest. If you get into mountain biking, let's say, it's highly likely that you will enjoy watching lots of mountain biking on YouTube. But the question is, you know, whether watching guys do tricks and flips and certain skills on the mountain bike, are they going to help you uh, actually be able to do those things or 
what allows you to do those things is getting on your bike and actually doing those things. It's obviously the latter. So I wouldn't say it's hurting you to watch a lot of content on YouTube. And yeah, you're going to pick up things here and there. If there's a gap in your knowledge and you see something and you have a place to insert it into your game, sometimes those things can be helpful. But understand that mostly you're watching it just as an expression of your interest in jujitsu, not because it's profoundly helping you. What's helping you most is just getting on the mat and training. Can you talk about the nervous feelings we all seem to get right before class that disappears once class starts? Do you know what I'm talking about? Why do we get that? Yeah, this falls under the category of performance anxiety, and it takes many, many forms. If you're a musician and you get stage fright, that's a form of performance anxiety. If you, um, uh, if you don't like getting in front of a group of people and speaking, if that makes you nervous, that's performance anxiety. If you are an athlete, let's say you're a basketball player and it's late in the game and you get fouled and now you have to go to the free throw line and make some free throws in crunch time, if you choke, that's performance anxiety looking your way, Shaquille O'Neal. Um, so yeah, that's what it is. Now, generally there's a perfect condition under which you are going to be able to perform your best at whatever, whatever that activity is. And that involves on the one hand being very relaxed, on the other hand, having a heightened activated mind. There's a balance there. If you're too relaxed, you're not going to do well. If your mind is too activated, uh, you're not going to do well either. You have to have this balance between the two. So with people who are susceptible to performance anxiety, and it has to do with the, um, the prefrontal cortex, that front pro part of your brain that is responsible for complex tasks, what happens is you end up with too much activation and not enough relaxation. You get a bit of an adrenaline dump, and now um, you, you get this nervous feeling in the pit of your stomach. Uh, and, and so on. So that's not uncommon uh, with training. Eventually that goes away. Uh, you know, I, I think when I was a white belt, blue belt, if I went into an unfamiliar environment, a, you know, an unfamiliar dojo to train, I would get that nervous feeling. But I've been training long enough now that I can walk in anywhere and be totally calm. So some of that I think goes away with practice and so on. But, but I think that's where it comes from. It's a form of performance anxiety. A simple video on gi, mat, and general rules on etiquette for BJJ would be nice. Love your vids. Saludos from Chicago. Um, yeah, I mean, honestly, most etiquette to me falls under a very simple equation, and that is this. Asking yourself the question, am I being the best training partner and the best student I possibly can be. And there are a lot of elements to that, but if you ask yourself those basic questions and the answer is no, then you need to fix that. For example, let's say you work manual labor and you're sweaty, you know, sweating all day. If you just go to class right after work without showering, are you being the best training partner and the best student you can be? No, or if you're a student and you went to the gym and you came directly from the gym to train jujitsu and you're, you're already smelling bad, no, you need to take a shower. I mean, my rule of thumb is I always take a quick shower before going to train jujitsu. And then what happens on the mat is part of that equation too. If you're 30 pounds heavier, then the person you're going with and you're going 100% intensity, well, that's kind of unfair, right? Or if you're training with a woman, she's 130 pounds, you're 180 pounds and you take it to her, okay, that's not answering that question I asked in the positive way. Are you being the best training partner you can be? If you are drilling technique, your teacher has shown something, after two repetitions, you're just sitting there shooting the breeze with your training partner and you're not drilling. Again, are you the best training partner you can be? No. So just ask yourself that question at all times. Am I being the best student, the best training partner, the model, the ideal training partner 
so that everybody loves training with me, so that I'm an example for everybody else, and so that I maximize my ability to learn and get good at jujitsu. If you ask yourself that, then pretty much mat and gi etiquette works itself out. A list of your top 10 discoveries that have had the largest impact on your life sorted in descending order. <laughs> um, personally, I think that life is mostly about having small discoveries, small epiphanies. You get small insights over time. Very few times in my life have I had some major transformative insight that has changed my entire trajectory but I've had a million small little epiphanies, the totality of which have had a huge impact on my life. So while I appreciate this question, I am not the guy to come up with a list in any sort of chronological order because I'm not a guy that thinks this way. I'm more about having the small epiphanies and having those on a regular basis, which helps you grow and expand and continue to move forward. Just started BJJ, getting tapped a lot and feeling a little overwhelmed. What should I be focused on? Uh, one of the things that I recommend to all my beginners is this. Uh, and there's two components to this. One is offensive and one is defensive. Offensively, don't be in a hurry to get a submission. Stop worrying so much about the submission. Now, it's human nature. In some ways, the way that we gauge our progress in jujitsu is by how often we get the tap. If you get the tap, you're better than if you don't get the tap, right? But that's, uh, it's not a great metric when you're new at jujitsu. A better metric is, can I get to a dominant position? And can I retain this dominant position? Can I retain it so that the person simply cannot get out of this position. That's a much better metric uh, as far as your progress in jujitsu. And ultimately, that's what's going to lead you to having a much higher finishing percentage because you can control people. It's that old saying, position before submission. So many people lose the position when they go for the submission and they get reversed or whatever. So. The best thing to do is when you're on offense, become as here on Gracie says, become a scientist. Put someone in that dominant position and see how long you can stay there. And if someone escapes, there's a piece of data. Oh, uh, how did they escape? That's something that I need to shore up. Then the next time you're in that position, figure out how to block that escape path. And once you've blocked that escape path, maybe there's a different way that someone is able to escape and then you need to figure out how to block that escape path. And ultimately the goal is to be able to control people so well that you can then multitask. Maybe you're controlling using your body, which allows you to free up your arms so that you can set up the submission, right? That's generally uh, uh, how submissions become much more high percentage when you can dominate someone and you can multitask so that you can get the submission without losing the position. The earlier in your journey you begin learning to control, the better off you'll be. So don't even think about the submission. That's number one. Let people try to escape and see how long you can stay in that position. When they get out, that gives you something to work on. Defensively, play the opposite game. Just be comfortable in that bottom position and see how long it takes people to submit you. If they can submit you quickly, it means you have work to do. You have to get your elbows in, you have to keep things tight, and just play a more defensive style of jujitsu. So begin with that, a positional approach to jujitsu where you're not so in a hurry to get out from the bad position and you're not so in a hurry to get the submission that you lose the position. You start with a, uh, a positional oriented game. And then as you get better and better and better, then you start really focusing on the submissions. Then you really start focusing more on how to get yourself out of these uh, disadvantaged positions once you're able to stay there comfortably without getting tapped.